Okay, let us get started. Hello everyone. We are truly honored to have Dr. Jeffrey Rosenthal as the first speaker of the 2021 Winter Lecture Series organized by the Georgia chapter of the American Statistical Association. Dr. Rosenthal is a professor of statistics at the University of Toronto. He obtained his BSc degree from the University of Toronto at the age of 20, his PhD in mathematics from Harvard University at the age of 24, and a tenure at the University of Toronto at the age of 29. He received the 2006 CRM SSC Prize, the 2007 COPS Award, 2013 SSC Gold Medal, and a 2019 President's uh, Impact Award and numerous teaching awards at both Harvard and Toronto. He is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Rosenthal's book for the general public, Struck by Lightning, was published in 16 editions and 10 different languages and was a bestseller in Canada leading to numerous media and public appearances and to his work exposing Ontario lottery retailer scandal. It was followed by a second book for the general public, Knock on Ode, Luck, Chance and the Meaning of Everything. He is truly multi-talented, computer, computer game programmer, musical performer, improvisational comedy performer and is also fluent in French apart from English. He told me that despite being born on Friday the 13th, he has been a very fortunate person and we are very fortunate to have him with us today. As a token of our appreciation, we have a small plaque to give him. <laughs> now, well, here I show it to you, we'll mail it to you later. Nice. <laughs> and um, he is uh, going to talk on Monte Carlo algorithms today. So without further ado, I request Dr. Rosenthal to deliver his lecture. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that very nice introduction and for inviting me and especially for sticking with me because as some of you may know, it was actually over two years ago that you first very kindly invited me to come visit Georgia. And we eventually settled on, I was gonna give a joint colloquium in April of 2020. And then I booked my flight and my hotels and everything. And I was gonna give another talk in Atlanta too. And then just before I was going to go, this thing called COVID hit and uh, everything got canceled. And I guess it got postponed a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And now we're doing this on Zoom uh, instead. But uh, I hope someday I get to visit in person and see the beautiful Georgia and your warm uh, hospitality and everything. But for today, we'll do it all on uh, Zoom. So thank you for that. Um, as I was saying before, to the extent that people are willing to switch their cameras on, to me, it feels a lot more like I'm with you if I can see you. So if anybody else is willing, I see a few people put their cameras on. <clears throat> Anyone else is willing, that would be great. But anyway, I will get started. So I'm going to do a share screen and hopefully this will work. Let's see. So first of all, just to check, can you now see my slide and my mouse moving around and everything? Yep. See so yeah, a thumbs up from Dan Hall. So that's good enough for me. Um, okay. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Monte Carlo algorithms and um, so I, I'm guessing that there's probably quite a wide variety in this audience of how familiar you are with them. And some of you probably are quite expert in them and others might not be so familiar. So I'm gonna keep it pretty basic and kind of start from the beginning, even though I realize some of you will be uh, far um, ahead of me. And in particular, I work more on the theory side or the sort of mathematical and methodological side of Monte Carlo algorithms, but I'll try to talk about some of the things I think about and then how that can have implications when you're actually running these algorithms. So. So to start off, um, say, well, what is Monte Carlo? Well, you probably know it's actually a uh, protectorate located along the south of France on the Mediterranean, a beautiful place, a lot of wealthy people, probably almost as beautiful as uh, Georgia. Um, and uh, that's what these algorithms were named after. Um, but uh, Monte Carlo, it also turned out to be a nice place for a conference. So here's a photo that, first of all, this is the famous casino Monte Carlo, which is uh, what inspired the uh, naming of these algorithms and the randomness that they use, but also a clever person some years ago said, hey, we're all studying Monte Carlo algorithms. Why don't we have our conference in Monte Carlo? So we did. And this picture has about six participants of the conference and the tall, hairy guy right there, that's me. So I got to visit Monte Carlo as a result of studying Monte Carlo algorithms. And um, 
So then people said, oh yeah, we should name other kinds of algorithms like the, uh, the Bora Bora algorithm. And then we can go have a, a, a vacation there or have a conference there. And now maybe we should have the Georgia algorithm so we can all come visit you in Georgia. But anyway, so of course today, what I really wanna talk about is Monte Carlo algorithms. And um, you know, if I had to summarize Monte Carlo in one simple phrase, I would say to sample is to know. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but the idea is if we can write a computer program to give us a random sample from some distribution, then we can really learn all sorts of things about that distribution. So for example, suppose I say, you know what? I'd like to estimate some fun function, say the Z to the fourth cosine Z where Z has a standard normal distribution. Well, there's lots of ways you might be able to compute this, but here's one really simple way just sample a large number of normal zero one random variables on a computer and take the average of this function z to the fourth cosine z. And for large M, this will give you a good approximation to the true expected value. Or maybe you wanna take an integral of some uh, function sine of whatever. Well, no problem. We'll just generate some random variables, which in this case are uniform zero one because that's the range of integration. And then take the average of those function values for those sample points and for large M, this will be close to uh, the true answer for the integral. So you don't have to remember how to do integration, just uh, run a random sample. Um, the most common example of relevance to statisticians is uh, something kind of different, but it's something you're probably familiar with, which is... Alpha breath. Alpha breath. a little noise there. Do other people hear that too? Plates went for the switch and the receptacle in the master. Should be fine. Uh, is everyone hearing that or just me? No, no, uh, it was some uh, noise, but I muted. So. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so um, so the most common example from the uh, statistician's point of view really is in Bayesian statistics, where you have some sort of a model and then you have some data and you take conditions and you end up with a posterior density. And this has turned out to be a hugely important example in statistics. And it says, well, suppose if you get a nice sample of random variables from your posterior density, and this might be a high dimensional density, so there might be some random high dimensional vectors. And if you have a lot of them, well, if you just look at their histogram or use them to make a density estimate, that can give you pictures of pi maybe in the different coordinates and so on. So you can start to understand pi, whether it has many modes, where the mass is and so on. If you wanna know the mean of pi, well, no problem. You got a nice big sample, just take the average of this big sample, that'll give you a good estimate of the mean. Um, if you want to take the mean of any function, maybe you know, the expected value of some function of this big high dimensional space of unknown parameters and so on, no problem, just average up those function values over your sample. Or you want to know the probability of some event, no problem, just take the fraction of the samples which are in that event. So the point is, if we have a good sample, so I say you know, to sample is to know, if you have a good sample, you can figure out all kinds of things. And in particular, if you have a sample from a posterior distribution, you can use that in Bayesian statistics. And related algorithms are used in all sorts of other things from medicine to physics, uh, computational things, financial things, engineering things. So there's lots and lots, you know, thousands and thousands of papers every year that are written using different versions of Monte Carlo algorithms to compute all these kind of things. Um, so that's why I say to sample is to know. Now, probably most of you are already familiar with that. But of course, the real issue is, you know, if we could sample, then it's so good and we get so much information. But then we can start to ask, well, how can we sample? You know, how do you sample from a big, complicated, high dimensional density? And it might not be that simple how to get a sample from that kind of a thing. So one very common way is Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. And it's sort of an iterative procedure, which allows us to sample. So uh, in particular, we can think about the Metropolis algorithm, which you know goes back to 1953, which I always find incredible when you think of the the kind of computers they had to, to deal with then were pretty spoiled now. But um, what did the Metropolis algorithm say? It said, you know what? Here's an iterative way to update a state X, which could be a high dimensional state of a, um, you know, on some state space. And we want to try to get samples from some target distribution pi. Well, here's what we do. If we have a state X, we propose a new state, call it Y, from some distribution, which depends on X. And I'll assume for now that Q is uh, symmetric about X. There's a generalization if it's not, but let's say some new random variable symmetrically around X, and then we either accept or reject it. So the rule is you look at the target pi value of the new state. If it's more than the current pi value, you always accept it. If it's less than the current pi value, 
then you just accept it with a certain probability, pi of the new state over pi of the old state. Otherwise, you just reject and stay where you are. And I kind of sit back and watch the magic. So I'm going to run a few uh, simulations for you. And here's the first one. So first of all, just to make sure everyone can now see the pink pink rectangle with my mouse and everything. Yeah. So okay. So this is my own little um, uh, program I wrote to illustrate a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm or a Metropolis algorithm. And here's how it works. So the Blue bars here represent the target probability pi. Now, in a real application, this would be a high dimensional complicated density maybe. But in this case, we'll think of it as a probability function just on six points. So the heights represent the probability. So pi of one is about 0.04, pi of two is about 0.18 it looks like, pi of three is about 0.22, pi of four is 0.09 maybe. Anyway, so these are numbers which add up to one. And we say, well, suppose we'd like to get a sample from the probability corresponding to these six probabilities. Now, of course, we don't need anything fancy to sample from six different points, but suppose we said we're going to run a metropolis algorithm to try to sample from these probabilities. Here's how we do it. So the black dot's going to represent our markup chain, and it happened to start at the state five. And then here's what it's going to do. And hopefully this will work for me. There we go. So each time I, uh, each new step, it's going to propose, in this case, a very simple thing to either add or subtract one with probability a half each. And it's going to happen randomly. I don't know what it's going to do, but it's from five. It's going to propose either to go to four or to six. In this case, it proposed to go to six. So the proposal turns yellow. I mean, it's deciding now whether to accept it or not. And then once it does, it looks at pi of six. And since pi of six is actually bigger than pi of five, it will always accept it. So I know it's going to turn green. And that means the black dot's going to move over. It says, so, okay, we accepted that proposal. And that was one step of the Metropolis algorithm. Then I could do it again. So again, it's going to propose to add one or subtract one. In this case, it chose to subtract one. And now it says, well, pi of five is actually less than pi of six. It's not too much less. It's maybe about 70%, it looks like. So there's something like a 70% chance that it's going to accept this proposal. And oh, it accepted it anyway. So that means the black dot moves. Let me see if I can get a rejection for you. Um, OK, now it proposed to go to four. So it looks at pi of four over pi of five. Looks like maybe a 55 or 60% chance. Let's see what it does. Oh, it accepted that one too. Let's we'll do a few more because I want to get at least one rejection for you. It'll always accept a three because pi is bigger there. Um, this time it, okay, it's going to propose to go back to four. Only has, looks like what, maybe a 35% chance of accepting. Let's see if it does or doesn't. Okay, it finally rejected once. So that means it turned red. And that means the black dot just stays where it is. So it doesn't move over. So pretty simple. And if I let this run, now it's going to run automatically. Each time it's proposing to add or subtract one, and then it's accepting or rejecting by looking at pi of the new state over pi of the old state. And if the new state has a bigger pi, it always accepts. If it has a smaller one, then it accepts with that ratio. By the way, if it proposes to go to seven, it always rejects because pi of seven is zero. We stop there. So it's always going to reject those moves. But OK, and I could let it go a little faster. And it's proposing, and it's accepting or rejecting. This is the Metropolis algorithm in action. So far, it might not seem that exciting, but let me add one more ingredient, which are some black bars. And I call this the uh, empirical distribution. And I just mean what fraction of the time has the black dot, has the markup chain, spent at each of these six different points so far. So, so far, it looks like it spent the most time at six, almost as much time as five, a little bit of time at four, a little bit at three, hasn't gone to one or two at all. So, okay, but we can just keep track. But then as we run this faster, let me get this going a little faster. Um, it's going to propose and accept or reject. So again, this very simple rule, just propose a new state and then either accept it or reject it by this very simple rule. And it'll take a while, so let me speed up a little more. Um, but eventually, I'm not doing a great job because we're stuck mostly at five and six so far. But what I know will happen in the long run, and it might be taking, I'm going to warp speed now to try to get this going for us. So uh, it's proposing, it's accepting or rejecting, but what's going to happen over time, and I'm not making it do this, it's happening randomly. But what will happen is that the black bars will converge to the blue bars. And what does that mean? It means that the fraction of time, we'll slow down a bit now, the fraction of time that it spends at each of these states will converge to the target probabilities, to the blue probabilities. Now, you might not find that quite as exciting as I do, but uh, to me, this is uh, amazing. First of all, it's amazing that it works and that it converges to the right thing. But also, um, it's useful because in a real example, these blue bars would be very complicated things that Maybe we could evaluate pi at a point, but we couldn't compute the probabilities or the expected values and so on. But on the other hand, the black dot, that's what we're running on the computer. So we can keep track of that. 
So that's our samples. The black dot is our samples. And we can use that to get a sample, which is a good approximation to the target um, probability that we want. So this is the Metropolis algorithm in a nutshell. If you didn't know it before, now you do, but I, I, um, I realized some of you already knew it. But in any case, this is the Metropolis algorithm. And everything I'll say today will be related to how we can understand and improve upon and modify this Metropolis algorithm. So I'll be coming back to that a few more times. But uh, for now, let's just say, OK, so that's the uh, Metropolis algorithm. Let's say the black. Uh, bars will converge to the blue bars, meaning the fraction of time that the, the chain spends it at every uh, state will converge to the target probability. And, you know, I still feel, even though I've been studying this for about 30 years now, that it's kind of magic that it actually converges. But of course, it's not magic. It's from uh, Markov chain theory. So the process is uh, irreducible. There's no problems there. But also this simple accept reject rule was chosen just right to make the process be reversible with respect to pi which means that pi is a stationary distribution. So these fractions are going to converge. So happens because of simple Markov chain theory. And I'll, I'll actually come back to that a little bit too. Um, so the idea is, well, we could still use this to estimate, for example, the expected value of a functional. So the traditional thing is we'll throw away some initial samples. Let's, let's say a capital B of them, which is called the burn-in, because we say, well, at the beginning, maybe it hasn't really converged to the right probabilities. But after a while, it's approximately converged. And then if we take an average of our functional with respect to these samples, it gives us a good approximation to the expected value. So this is, you know, an incredibly uh, popular thing. As you probably know, it's completely revolutionized Bayesian statistics. And it's used all over the place. So, okay, so that's MCMC, right? So then, um, well, let me give one more example. And then I'll talk some about how the theory can come into it. So here's a somewhat more substantial example. I'll call it an interacting particle system. So I'll imagine that there's going to be n particles in a region. In the simulation I'll do, there'll be five. And we say, suppose their probabilities are proportional to e to the minus h, where by analogy with physics, h is called an energy function, but some probabilities. And then we say, what, you know, what does a typical configuration look like? What are the different probabilities? What are the averages? For example, what's the average of the rightmost location and so on? And again, we would say, well, to compute this directly, you'll see it will be very difficult or impossible, maybe. But then to uh, sample from it, maybe we can do that using Monte Carlo or at least using Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so let me give a specific example, and then I'm going to run a um, simulation. So here's an example where we said, suppose we've got n particles, and we say the probability of a configuration has a density proportional to e to the minus h, where this is h. So it's just some big complicated thing to say it briefly. H is, as a, so A, let's say, measures, is multiplying the distances between the particles. So if A is big, it means the energy gets big when they're far apart. So since it's trying to make the energy small, it's trying to bring them close together. But B is the opposite. It's the some of the reciprocals of the distances. So if, uh, um, if B is large, then when they're really close, the energy gets high. So it tends to push them apart. And then C is just C times the sum of their X values, if you think of them on an XY plane. So if C is big, it means it, they don't want to go too far to the right, so they tend to go to the left. So it's just a simple, um, well, not so simple, but it's an example of the configurations where we have um, some number of particles, and they're feeling these different pressures, right? The probabilities are that, well, they, they, they want to be close together, but not too close. They should still keep some distance, and they want to go towards the left, but not too much because they shouldn't get too close to each other. And... If I said, you know, what is the distribution of, say, the rightmost point, the maximum of all the x values, or the average distance between them, or, you know, what, what part of the screen they tend to fit on, or whatever, wouldn't be that clear. And I don't know how to just write a program to give me a sample of n particles whose probabilities are proportional to this kind of function. But Metropolis algorithm, no problem. So the idea is what I'll do is I'll go through the particles one at a time each time proposing to move it a little bit and then accepting or rejecting it by the exact same rule as before. So let me try to run that. So here's another simulation that hopefully you can see. I've got five particles, these five black dots, and the region here is the pink rectangle. And the rule is I would like them to be sampled proportional to e to the minus h, where h is that crazy function. And I chose some values for those a, b, and c parameters, but they're all positive. So they're trying to be close to each other, but not too close, and towards the left, but not too far. And how is it all going to work? Well, I'll run a Metropolis algorithm, which chooses one of the particles. In this case, it chose this one. And it's going to propose to move it. So it proposed to move it just a little bit here. And then it has to decide, 
should it move this particle here or not? So it's the same rule as before, but it's a little harder to picture. It has to say, if this particle was here, then what would that pi be, that e to the minus h? Would it be bigger or smaller than if the particle's here? If it would be bigger, it should always accept it. If it would be smaller, it should accept it with the ratio of the new pi value over the old one. So I don't know if it's going to accept it or not. I think it might actually, but let's see. Uh, it didn't. I was wrong. It rejected it. It said, no, I'd rather keep that particle where it is. And then it takes a different particle, this one now, and it proposes to move it a little bit. In that case, that way, is it going to accept or reject it? I think it might reject that one too, because it's making them too far apart, but I'm not sure. Let's see. Yep, it rejected that one too. I'm going to propose a new one. Now it's proposing to move this one there. I don't know. It might reject that one too. Let me get it going a bit while I uh, talk. So I'm not touching it now, but it's uh, running. And it's, oh, that time it accepted one, which I guess makes sense because it kind of moved them a little closer. It accepted that one too. Let them go a little faster. So it's proposing to move one and then it's either accepting or rejecting it. And we know the probabilities should be such that it makes them want to get close to each other, but not too close and a little bit to the left, but maybe not too much so. And you can see it's going to take a while. I'll let it run a little faster. And while we're at it, I also think I have an option to show the, the rightmost point, the maximum x value, because that's the functional I made up. So I suppose we want to know the average value of the rightmost functional. Well, we wouldn't really want to count it yet because we're, we're still probably not converged to the right distribution. But if I run this for a while, let me get it running a little faster. It's proposing and then it's accepting or rejecting. And um, after a while, it should be that the probabilities for this sample, that they're roughly the probabilities from the target distribution. And then that means if I start averaging up this rightmost value, I start to get a pretty good estimate of the true mean of this rightmost value. So it's another example. And um, you, know, you can let it run for a while. I think it's starting to get pretty close to convergence because you can see the, the dots are pretty close to each other, but not too close. And they're pushing towards the left, but not too much, which is what we predicted based on the uh, the target density that I fit in. But again, I didn't know that, and I still don't really know how how accurate this, the the sample is. But if I let it run for a while, I can go even faster. We say, okay, we're getting a pretty good sample, and so we're getting pretty good estimates. Okay, so that's just another example of a sort of harder example of how we could use MCMC, where you really couldn't estimate those probabilities directly, unlike the six point example, which would just be easy, but but you couldn't, but nonetheless, we can see it uh, see it run like that, okay. So then you can say, well, what sort of theory is known about this? And it turns out that over the years, a bunch of us have been working on the theory of these Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. And we've learned various things which seem like they can be sometimes helpful for practice. And that's what I wanna spend the rest of the time talking about. So- Excuse me. Yeah? May I ask a question? Uh, okay, I so just sure. wonder why the C bigger than zero, it means particles like to be towards the left. For mm -hmm. this C part, it means free energy in statistical physics or in other statistical uh, literature. But why C bigger than zero means it goes to the left? Yeah, so the formula, so the formula is, is yeah. Okay, the formula is from the um, the energy function here. So the energy function we put in is c times the sum of the x's. So if c is big, let's say, and positive, then if the x's are big, that means we get a bigger h function, and then the probability is proportional to e to the minus h. So when the energy gets bigger, then the probabilities get smaller. Okay. But the y goes to the left, and not to the right. Yeah. So when the x's get bigger, then uh, this sum gets bigger, and it gives us a bigger energy. So it, try, it doesn't want to do that. It wants to make this a smaller sum so that the, the probabilities are bigger, okay? Okay, so um, let's say that, um, yeah, so what can we say theory-wise? So we can say that, um, uh, so um, in order for MCMC to be useful, we want it to converge, right? If it's not going to converge, then uh, we're not, um, we're not uh, uh, going to be happy because we're not going to be getting good samples, right? So. So what can we say about quick convergence? Well, what ideally we'd like to do and what I actually spent the uh, early part of my career largely focused on is trying to prove theorems about how quickly it converges. So if you think back to the, you know, the simulation that we were doing here with the black bars and the blue bars, we could say, well, I'd like to be able to prove that after a certain number of iterations, some n star number, let's say, that the black and the blue bars will be within some small tolerance, say 0.01 of each other. And if I could do that, then I'm happy. Then I say, okay, you know what? I'm pretty happy because I proved that if you run this markup chain for a certain number of steps, then I'll be close to uh, stationary. So that would be good. Um, 
And I worked on that pretty hard and I did make some progress on it. And so, for example, in one, you know, pretty complicated Bayesian model with a pretty complicated Metropolis algorithm, I was able to bound everything using a method called coupling. And I was able to prove in that case that after 140 iterations, I could prove that the sample probabilities would be within 0.01 of the stationary probabilities. And I was pretty proud of that. But at the same time, it was a lot of work just to get it bound for one particular example. And really people like to use these for lots of different examples. And I started to realize there's just no way I'm gonna be able to prove bounds that are gonna be useful for all the examples people are doing. So instead, what uh, people have focused on more is to do with um, which proposal is sort of optimal or converges the fastest. So if we go back to this first example here, go zero the counts and start over, we can have our um, metropolis that we started before where you propose plus or minus one each time. But I call it to say, you know what? I'm going to change it to a new version, which does plus or minus, so plus or minus one or two each time. So in other words, from two, it proposes to go to three or four or one or zero, each with probability a quarter. And then it still accepts or rejects them with the same rules, that same probability as before, but it's proposing plus or minus one or two each time instead of just plus or minus one. And if I let that run a little faster, then you can say, okay, well, it's running too, and it's still true by markup chain theory, just like before, that if I ran this long enough, the black bars will converge to the blue bars. I'm sure of that. But I could say, will they converge faster or slower? That is to say, is this a better version of the Metropolis algorithm or a worse version? And then you could say, well, never mind plus or minus one or two. What about plus or minus one or two or three? Now, as it's each time, it's with probability one six each. It's doing plus one, plus two, plus three, or minus one, minus two, minus three. And here's another version of trying to get the black bars to converge. I still know if I ran this for a long time, the black bars will converge to the blue bars, but is this better or worse? Now you might be thinking maybe it's better, right? Because instead of it taking a long time, say we're at one, it takes a really long time until we can move over to six. Now we can move in just a couple steps, right? We're taking nice big steps. And that's kind of right. We think it's maybe better if you can take bigger steps, but only within certain limits. For example, suppose I, take this radius as I call it, and I make it plus or minus one, two, three, four, up to 10. Well, that's not great. Most of the time it's proposing things right off the edge of the screen. That was a good proposal, but most of the time it's proposing things out here or even off the edge of the screen. And it's really not moving very much at all because it's rejecting a lot. So that's not so good either. So in other words, you can start to think that when we do our proposal, you know, we don't want to just propose plus or minus one because that'll take too long to go anywhere. But we also don't want to propose all the way out to 10 because then we'll reject a lot. And that won't do very well either. So then you say, what's the optimal? And you can see that the optimal is somewhere in between those extremes. And if you think in terms of acceptance rates, then you can think that, well, if we just do plus or minus one, we'll probably accept a lot of the moves, but we're not going to move very far. But if we do plus or minus all the way up to 10, we'll move a lot if we ever accept a move, but we won't accept very many. So in terms of the acceptance rate or the fraction of times we accept the proposals, if it's really close to zero, that's not very good. We're rejecting a lot. But if it's really close to one, that's also not very good because we're probably just proposing to move a little bit. So we get this sort of interesting uh, optimality um, feeling. And um, here's a, a more, a, a, an example to show that more concretely. Suppose I just ran a simple example where the target was a standard normal distribution. And from each point X, I'm going to propose to move by a normal increment centered at the current X, but with some sigma squared. And you say, what's the best sigma squared? Well, I ran three different versions of it. So here's what are called the trace plots, which are just seeing what happened to X as, as a time moves upward. So in other words, starting at the bottom and moving up. And the target is the standard normal, which is drawn in blue each time. And here's three different versions of the Metropolis algorithm showing what happens as we move up. If you look at the first one, you can say, gee, it's really not moving very far, right? It's just wiggling a little bit, a little bit, it takes a really long time to move around. It's probably not very good. And well, you can probably guess it's because, maybe I'll give you the next line. It's because the proposals were quite small. In this case, Sigma was 0.1. It was just proposing to move a little bit. And you know, if you only move a little bit, it's not gonna mix that well. This one, I took a really big Sigma. Sigma was 25. And in this case, if you look closely, you can see there's various periods where it's, it's a, a, a vertical line, meaning that it, X stayed exactly the same for a large number of iterations, 
which of course means it was rejecting all the proposals, right? So here's a case where, you know what, it started here, but it, um, it rejected, rejected, rejected. And you say, oh, we know about that. That's because it's proposing too big. It's proposing places that it's always gonna reject. So this sigma was too big. Here's the compromise. I chose sigma is 2.38. And in this case, it seems like it moves around really well. And this is clearly the best version of the Metropolis algorithm to use. This one sigma is too small. This one sigma is too big. And if we look in terms of the acceptance rates, AR, well, here it accepted 96% of the moves, which sounds good, but it wasn't good because the only reason it accepted so many is it was proposing to move really slow. In this case, it only accepted 5% of the moves and that was too few, so it was getting stuck all the time. In this one, it accepted about 44% of the moves and this is actually a really good version. So you can get some principle here. It says you wanna run the Metropolis algorithm, you want it to converge, you don't want the proposals to be too small. You don't want them to be too big. You want them to be just right. Or the acceptance rate, you don't want it to be too big. You don't want it to be too small. You want it to be just right. And whatever I think, you know, you want moderate values. Um, and whenever I think of that, I always think of this person. Probably you can recognize this is uh, Goldilocks. And uh, Goldilocks knows a thing or two about things that are not too big, not too small, but just right. So. So I call this the Goldilocks principle. I've actually put that in, in print and now other people are calling it that too. So, so this principle that um, you know you, uh, you don't wanna to propose too big, but you don't wanna to propose too small. So, so far that's just kind of a heuristic or you know, a good, good rule of thumb. But theory people, we say, well, can we, can we go further with it? And turns out we can say some more precise things too. So um, this next thing I wanna talk about is learning from uh, diffusion limits, which probably some of you are experts on and others maybe uh, haven't seen them in a while and find them scary, I'm not sure. But uh, so diffusion limits, let's first of all, recall the sort of basic diffusion limit from uh, Brownian motion, which is, I'll put the graph here, which is if you think of simple random walk, that is you just add or subtract one each time, but then you take a modified version of it where you speed up time by a factor of D for large D. So you're doing faster and faster moves but you shrink space by the square root of D, so you're doing smaller and smaller moves. Then as D gets bigger, it converges to Brownian motion. So that is say you're doing lots and lots of moves just in time one over D, but you're only moving smaller amounts, one over root D. And this, as, 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 as D gets larger, this is converging to Brownian motion. So hopefully that's familiar to all of you, maybe, um, um, yeah, hopefully so. And then, um, the first theorem of this, which, which predates my involvement in it, is that, Something similar holds for the Metropolis algorithm, at least in the following sense. Suppose you're doing a Metropolis algorithm where the target is, is a D dimensional and D is going to infinity. So it's kind of like the D going to infinity for Brownian motion, but it's a little bit more subtle here. It's the dimension of the space is going to infinity. And you run a Metropolis algorithm and it has normal proposals. And then if you look at just one coordinate, like let's say the first coordinate, then under certain very strong assumptions, which I'll talk about a little more, if you look at that first coordinate, you know, which is kind of like uh, these things here where you're looking at say one coordinate and saying, how does it move and so on? It's saying, you know what? It will converge to a, sorry, back here. It will converge to a diffusion. And in fact, it will converge to a diffusion which has a certain speed associated with it. And that speed will be proportional to a certain function of the acceptance rate. So in other words, you're doing bigger and bigger, um, higher and higher dimension. And then you, you, you sort of uh, renormalize it so that you're doing faster and faster moves. But because it's higher dimension, you have to do smaller and smaller proposals. So it's just like for Brownian motion. And you end up saying you're gonna converge to a diffusion which has speed, which is proportional to this crazy function of the acceptance rate where here, this uh, capital phi inverse, that's the inverse CDF of a standard normal. So that kind of comes into this expression. And this is something that can be plotted numerically. And it says there's a relationship between the um, acceptance rate of your algorithm, that is what fraction of those metropolis moves you were accepting, and the speed of this resulting limited, uh, the resulting limiting diffusion of your algorithm. And it turns out you can do something like this. And in particular, it has a maximum when the acceptance rate is about equal to 0.234, as it turns out numerically. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that in some sense, again, under these very strong conditions, it's optimal to scale your Metropolis algorithm. So the acceptance rate, well, it isn't near zero. We already knew that was bad. And it isn't near one. We already knew that was bad. 
but actually we're as close to this magic number 0.234. It um, doesn't have to be exactly 0.234 because it's gonna be pretty big if you're near 0.234, but it gives some quite uh, clear concrete uh, information about the efficiency of the Metropolis algorithm as it depends on the, um, on the uh, proposal scaling and in particular on the acceptance rate. And also we can say a little more by looking more closely at this limiting diffusion argument and say that it's optimal to do a proposal. Remember, this could be in high dimensions. So you're going to, from a given X, you're going to propose where to move next. And it's good to take the uh, covariance of that increment proposal normal distribution, sigma, to be some function, some multiple of the target covariance. So this is a bit subtle here, but it says, you know, we're trying to converge to the target distribution, to the blue bars, right, to the, the, this uh, pi that we're interested in. And that pi, because it's some distribution on d-dimensional space, it has some covariance, which is associated with the d-coordinates of, of, of pi, and then take this multiplier of it. So if d is large, it's a small multiplier, but a small multiplier of that target covariance, that turns out to be the optimal covariance that you should use when you're doing your normal proposals in order to run a metropolis algorithm. So that's kind of interesting. There were other various, various, various uh, generalizations and extensions, but I won't get into that right now. I just want to show you a, a simulation to try to convince you that this is useful information. So here's a 20 dimensional metropolis algorithm that I ran. And um, I said, okay, we're going to do a metropolis algorithm where the proposals will be a normal distribution centered at the current state with some, some covariance matrix for how we're going to do those increments. And what is it going to be? So the first thing you might say, well, I'll just take the identities. That is, we're doing, doing a standard normal increment in a 20 dimensions. And here's a plot kind of like before that shows time going upwards. And the target of that first coordinate is again a normal. And here's what it is in blue. And here's that first coordinate of our markup chain. Not very good, right? It's really not moving around very much. It's pretty much getting stuck. And if you look closely again, you can see there are these long vertical bars. So it's really rejecting a lot of moves. It's getting stuck in the same place for a long time. And I also included the, the histogram, which is to say, if we use this run and said, let's use this run to try to estimate what's the target distribution. So we're trying to estimate the blue curve. That's the thing we'd like to sample from, but actually we're doing a terrible job. We're just getting stuck near zero. The histogram doesn't match the blue bar at all. So that was pretty bad, but we know something about that. We know that, you know what? The acceptance rate shouldn't be too big and shouldn't be too small. So what was the acceptance rate? Well, in this case, the acceptance rate was 0.017, so just 1.7%. So we say, okay, we know that means the acceptance rate was too low. That means we're proposing things that are too big. That's why they're all being rejected. No problem. Let's use a smaller sigma. So Excuse let's do uh, uh, in your last slide, you mentioned the computational complexity is big O uh, D. D is the dimension of the target distribution. Why yeah. it is that? How do you define the computational complexity? Well, computational complexity has to do with how many iterations you have to run in order to converge. We can talk about that after if you want. Right now, let me give the talk the way I want to, and then we can talk about that in the questions if you want. Um, but it's a whole separate issue of computational complexity. So, um, okay, so for the second try, we could say, well, let's do a very small proposal. So we say, okay, well, you know what? It wasn't good having the proposal be a 20 dimensional identity covariance matrix. Let's use a really small multiple of it. And then um, here's the, what we get. So um, again, looking at it going up, it really isn't moving very much. So this is a case where the proposals are too small, right? And it's, it's not rejecting very much. And in fact, if we check the acceptance rate was 65%, so it's accepting plenty of these moves, but it's still, the histogram is terrible. It's not converging very well. So we say, you know what? This really isn't a very good, um, a very good uh, markup chain either. We say, okay, well, no problem. We, we know that because the acceptance rate was too small. Okay. So then you say, well, let's try again. And this time I tried to find a good multiple of the identity to get an acceptance rate close to that 0.234. That's what we know would be really good choice, right? So let's run that. And here's what we get this time. So here's a case where the acceptance rate was indeed close to 0.234, which according to the Goldilocks principle, that was just right but this really doesn't look very good. It's still meandering around. It's not moving very well. The histogram is not uh, you know, approximating the target at all. And this is where you can get kind of frustrated because you say, you know what? We had all that theory that said 0.234 was a pretty good acceptance rate. 
Now I adjusted my multiple of sigma to try to make it be a good acceptance grade and I got it and it's still not converting very well. And um, well, why is that? Well, let me do one more example because remember I said that there's this additional theory which says the optimal is to choose your proposals where the proposal covariance scaling is proportional to the target covariance with this magic formula. So let's try that. And if you try that one, it's down here, all of a sudden, you know what? This is working much better. It's actually moving around. It's exploring the whole state space. And if we do a histogram, okay, this isn't perfect, but it's pretty good after just, uh, what is that, that 2,000 iterations, we got a pretty good estimate of the histogram. So it's working much better. Now, the acceptance rate is still about 0.234. So in terms of the acceptance rate, it's actually still pretty good. But in turn, you know, the acceptance rate was good both times. But here, because we had the right shape of the proposal, because we made the or is it the proposal uh, covariance was proportional to the target, it actually converged really well. So we think of these as good examples to say, you know, you know, there's lots of examples, including high dimensional ones. And we say, you know what, this theory can tell us something. We, we don't claim that theory can tell you everything about running MCMC. It can be hard in high dimensions. You have to play around and so on. But theory can say some things. And in particular, theory can make the difference between pretty good MCMC and really bad MCMC. Okay. So let me um, talk about one more topic uh, that theory has helped. And this is something I've worked on a lot in more recent years. Um, and then I'll summarize and then hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. But um, this is what's called adaptive MCMC. And I like to motivate it by starting with this optimality because this optimal, I guess I wrote here that you know, we have this theory that says under certain conditions, but it seems to apply pretty generally, the optimal proposal covariance is to have the Proposal covariance be this magic proportion of the target covariance, and you get an optimal acceptance rate and so on. So we like to say, hey, all these people running MCMC, here's the way you should do it, right? But then they say, and they're right, they say, how are we going to do that? So normally the target covariance would be unknown, right? You've got some big complicated high dimensional density function. You don't know the covariance of the different coordinates of that. And you don't know a priori what scaling is going to give you an acceptance rate close to 0.234. So sure, the theory gives us some optimality, but how are we going to make use of that? So that's where this um, adaptive MCMC comes into it. And um, so the idea of adaptive MCMC is to say, well, you know, we have this great formula. If we knew the target covariance, then we'd have a really good way of running MCMC. But on the other hand, MCMC is giving us a sample and samples are ways that we learn about the target, right? So what we can say is suppose we've been running MCMC for a while, let's use those first N samples to give us an empirical estimate of the target covariance. So I'll call it, call it a sigma sub N to mean based on the first N samples. And the idea is, well, okay, once we've run it for a while, we've got some samples, and those are samples on a d-dimensional space, so there's a certain random sample of vectors. Maybe we can use that random sample. Um, you can empirically estimate the covariance. In fact, R has a built-in function, a COV covariance, that'll just give you the covariance of a string of, of d-dimensional vectors. So let's use that as an estimate of, sig of uh, sigma sub pi, and then let's use the same formula, but for... Um, but for using sigma n instead. So if the run's going well, then we got a pretty good approximation to sigma pi, so we can still get a near optimal proposal. God. Hello? <laughs> You're hearing some noises again. Um, okay, so, um, so, so that's the idea. But on the other hand, there's two problems with it. One problem is it's sort of a chicken and egg thing that we're kind of saying, if we have a good run, then we can get a good estimate of sigma and we can use that to run a really good MCMC. And of course, if we run a really good MCMC, then we get a good estimate, but we're sort of like using the estimate to run a good markup chain to give us a good estimate. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. But then in addition, I told you before that the whole reason MCMC works is because of markup chain theory, right? And we say, oh, it's great. It's got all these properties, you know, reversible stationarity and so on. But now I'm telling you, adjust the rules for running your markup chain based on the whole history, based on sigma n. And if you know your markup chains, you know, you can't do that. You can't say that the markup chain, now the new state is going to depend on the whole history. So we've kind of cheated at the markup property and we've got this chicken and egg problem. So is this really going to work? So 
What's interesting is I would say, here's two questions. One is, does it work well in practice? And I can give a pretty strong yes. So we have some good examples. And I'll show you one in a second where it actually works pretty well in practice. But then we can say, well, is it really still going to converge to the right pie? And I can give you a clear answer there. And the answer is sometimes. That is not always, but it depends on the condition. So let me try to explain that. So first of all, let's look at, again, a 20-dimensional example, but this time where we're doing adaption as we go, OK? So um, oops, down on the next page. So here again, with time going up, this looks a little bit like a tornado is hit, but there's no tornado. What it is is as time goes up, we're starting here again, the blue bars are the um, target. And we say, well, you know what? Um, it's starting off, this is a really bad Markov chain, right? It's supposed to be you know, sampling from these, this blue curve, but actually it's just getting stuck. It's not moving very much. And then as you run it more, as time goes up, it starts to do a little better. It starts to move a little more. And you say, okay, maybe it's a little bit better than MCMC. But then we know that that means it's slowly starting to get a better estimate of the target covariance. And then it says, you know what? Once we get a better estimate, we start to run a better markup chain. And now by the time we get to approximately where this bar is, say, you know what? We've learned enough about the target that we got a good estimate of the target covariance. And that allowed us to run a good MCMC algorithm and then it converged really well. So if we do an estimate again, but just based on, let's say the top half, everything above this bar, then we say, you know what? It took a while, but we managed to learn enough and adapt enough to the point where we're running a really good MCMC algorithm and it's converging. And again, if you look at the histograms, it actually did uh, an excellent job as long as you give it enough time to do this adapting. So that's just one of many examples that we have now, which says, you know what? Adapting is pretty smart. And in particular, it's doing a, high dimensional uh, adaptation because it's doing like a 20 by 20 uh, a covariance matrix in this point. You couldn't do that by hand, right? You couldn't do trial and error to get a good 20 by 20 uh, proposal covariance matrix. But on the other hand, if you let the computer do it, the computer can eventually figure it out. So, so we think that's good evidence that it's working well. We have various other examples now in higher dimensions. And we say, you know what? Adaption works pretty well. And it helps to improve MCMC in ways that just human trial and error wouldn't be able to do. But on the other hand, does it still converge? And the answer is it might not still converge. And maybe I'll just quickly, I don't wanna to spend too long on this, but I'll quickly do an example where, let's see, let's start over again and um, let's zero this. And I'm gonna do an adaptive version now, which is a simple version here, which is, so remember it does plus or minus one to start with. But then I put in a rule now where if it does that, and then it, in that case it rejects, then it's just gonna stay at one. But if it accepts like it did now, now it says, you know what? This is pretty easy. Maybe I can do plus or minus one or two. So the next time it's going to do plus or minus one or two. Now it accepted that. It said, you know what? This is pretty easy. Next time it's going to do plus or minus one, two or three. And it's doing that on its own. I'm not changing that now. The computer is. But then it starts to get big. And now it's doing a big proposal. And now, you know what? It's proposed way over here. Of course, it's going to reject that. And then it says, you know what? I'm getting a little too big. I'll go back to just doing plus or minus one or two. And if I let it run, I'm not touching it now, it'll, okay, it's gonna accept that one. So now it'll go back to plus or minus one, two or three. And then oh, maybe it'll accept that. It'll go to plus or minus one, two, three or four. Um, oh, it rejected that because it's getting a little too big. Now it goes back to plus or minus one, two or three. And if I let this run faster, then not quite that fast. Then you can see sometimes it gets pretty big proposals but then it starts to learn it's rejecting too many and then it starts to give smaller proposals. And the good thing is, this is a simple example of adaptive MCMC where it's learning as it goes, right? I don't have to figure out whether it's best to do plus or minus one or two or plus or minus one, two, three or whatever. It's going to decide as it goes and sometimes do big proposals and sometimes little ones. And it mostly works well, but it also illustrates the problem. So let me put an extreme version here. So it's still doing the same thing, except I changed the target so that one, three, four, and five have big blue bars, and two just has a little tiny blue bar there. And this is an example I set up, especially to recognize that this smart seeming thing of doing adaptive MCMC eventually is gonna to lead to a problem here. I won't spend too long on it, but let's see. Now I have no idea. It could take a few iterations or a few hundred iterations to fall into the trap. So let's see, no, okay, let me, um, at least I'll run it a little faster, um, see if it could fall into the trap for you. Um, it almost fell into it, but then it didn't. Um, I'll just give you a bit of a hint that at some point, it, it goes to one sometimes. In fact, it's at one now, and that's okay. But if it ever goes to one and then starts rejecting a bunch of times, 
that's when the trouble begins. So far, maybe in Georgia, this isn't a problem and the, the markup chain never gets trapped, but I think it will um, get trapped soon, but maybe not. Um, all right, I'll go. I wanted to do it more dramatically, but let me go to warp speed to make sure that it happens there. Okay, so it finally happened. Now I'll slow it down again. So I'm sorry I had to do that a little fast, but once you go to enough iterations, eventually it proposes to go to one, and then it happens to reject a few times. Well, that'll happen sometimes, but now it's at the point where it's always rejecting these and almost always rejecting these because pi of two is so small. So it's actually in a sort of a stuck situation. Oh, it actually got out. <laughs> it rescued itself, which it doesn't do very often, but the point is, it could be stuck this way for a long time. And if I did run this at warp speed, which may I'll just do really quickly, it'll get stuck there enough that in the limit, the black bars will not converge to the blue bars. It'll actually converge to being a very big black bar here and these, these other black bars getting small. It'll escape every now and then. But the point is it's easier for it to get into the trap than to get out of the trap because it breaks the symmetry because it could have big proposals that get it into this trap without going through two. Whereas the only way to get out of the trap is to go through two, which is very unlikely because that's a small thing. So I won't belabor that longer, but I'll just say that it might fail to converge. And so um, what it means is that, well, for theory people, this provided a big opening for us because it said, here's an algorithm that in practice, it seems to work very well. It helps us to converge a lot faster. And a lot of the applied people think it's useful, but we know that it's possible to make examples where it just converges to totally the wrong thing we don't have the markup property. So we had to do harder um, versions of proving convergence, not just relying on markup chain theory, which is over hundred years old, but instead saying, you know what, what are some stronger assumptions which will guarantee that even if you are adapting and tweaking as you go, you will still converge to the right thing in the limit. And so we proved using a property called the diminishing adaptation, which just kind of means that it adapts less as it goes in, in a fairly mild sense. But then also a technical property containment, which doesn't come up very often, but it just prevents it from getting bad samples, which lead to a bad Markov chain, which lead to worse samples, which lead to a worse Markov chain. We need to be able to contain that. So a number of us have been working on this and come up with various uh, theorems. And later we did what I called um, adversarial Markov chain theory, which allowed us to come up with some more accessible conditions, just in terms of continuity and boundedness assumptions on the target and on the proposals, which allowed us to guarantee that it would converge. And I sometimes call this uh, adaptation for everyone, meaning that I feel that now applied users can use it and they can check these assumptions and make sure they're satisfied for their example. So um, also from a practical point of view, because people often ask, what about in practice, how am I going to use this adaptation? And the simplest thing you can do is adapt for a while to try to get a pretty good markup chain. And then just stop adapting and then run a good MCMC from then on. And then just you're using regular MCMC theory. And in fact, with the PhD student, uh, Jin Young Yang, we, um, we wrote a, a sort of adaptive convergence diagnostic, which is a way to um, get the computer to sort of try to figure out when it's done enough adapting so it can now stop adapting and just run regular MCMC. So that may be the best compromise. So, so let me just uh, wrap up and then see if there's questions. But um, so, if you only got one thing out of this talk, I hope you got the basic idea of MCMC if you didn't already know it and things like the Metropolis algorithm, they're very widely used, they're very easy to implement and they converge to the right distribution to allow you to estimate things about it. I still feel like it's magic even, even after 30 years. Um, sometimes you can prove quantitative bounds on how long to converge, that's what I worked on for a while, but, it, but it's pretty hard. Um, but on the other hand, diffusion limits can give certain optimality results, results like the Goldilocks principle, the, 0.234 acceptance rate and the optimal proposal covariance. Um, and that can make a big practical difference even in those simple examples that I showed you in terms of converging well or really not converting very well after quite a while. But then adapting, the last thing I talked about said, you know what, you can adapt the updating rules as you go to try to converge faster. And that seems to work well, but it won't always converge to the right thing. You have to be careful, but we have some theory about that. Um, Anyway, so I think there is, first of all, although there's so many Monte Carlo applications out there, there's lots more. And every time you come up with a new problem, usually there's a way to do it by Monte Carlo. But also on the theory side, we have a fair bit of theory now, but there's certainly lots of places where we don't understand things and there's lots more room for that. So I think it's a pretty interesting area and uh, I've worked on it for a while. If you're interested more like all the simulations I ran and everything, they're all available on my webpage or all my papers. Um, you can email me with questions, you can tweet about me. 
And I think I'll end off there and uh, hope for some questions. And again, thank you very much for inviting me down to Georgia, even if it was only on Zoom, but, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we can take questions now. How do you want to go first? Uh, yes, Jeff, this is a fascinating talk, uh, very interesting. So uh, you mentioned uh, in your last few slides about the probability, uh, the, the, the chance of stacking at the local maximum. So I'm, I'm just wondering about you know, recent, recent development of the big data methods, there are all kind of stochastic version of, of things like a stochastic gradient descent. So I'm wondering whether we can do a stochastic version of MCMC, -MC, like you know, do take a sub sample of the data and then do that. Will, will, will that alleviate the problem? Well, so a few things. I mean, first of all, of course, MCMC -MC is already stochastic, right? I mean, it's not like stochastic gradient descent. You start with the deterministic gradient descent and then make a stochastic version, but MCMC -MC is already stochastic. But you can certainly do other stochastic things, like you mentioned, taking a subset of the data, yeah. which is actually sometimes a smart idea. For example, if you've got uh, a very large data set, then it might be too slow to evaluate the full likelihood on every step of the algorithm. So people do things like that, take a subset of the data and just evaluate the likelihood function of, based on a subset. And that's faster that way. And that'll still work well. Um, that's a little bit different from the issue of being stuck in a mode. So I guess um, yeah, you're talking about stuck in a mode. Of course, this particular example that I gave here, I, I, I mean, this is related to being stuck in a mode. But of course, because of the adaption, it's related to converging wrong. But I guess let's say if I stop adapting and then I'm just running plus or minus one and maybe I'll run it for a while. Now, at least eventually it will converge to the right thing because I'm not adapting anymore because now it's going to be hard to get out of this trap, but it'll also be hard to get back into it. So in the long run, that will cancel out now, but it will take a very long time. So you're certainly right that we're stuck in like a local maxima or we're going to have trouble getting out. Um, so people do various things. There's a, a whole class of algorithms called uh, tempering algorithms that you may be familiar with, and they involve um, using flattened versions. So if this is pi, but then instead we take pi to the power of beta, where beta is a small positive number, then that flattens it, right? Because if you take small positive powers of a positive number, then it gets closer to one. So it'll make pi of two get bigger and the other pi's get smaller, but that's the wrong distribution. But with tempering algorithms, you you use those as an uh, intermediate step to try to um, to try to find your way out of the the local modes and converge to the right thing. So that's kind of a version, maybe, of what you're saying of adding some additional stochastic element in order to try to improve convergence or avoid being stuck in local modes. So there's a lot of things related to that. It's probably a big topic that we could talk about more, but related to um, what uh, other ways you can modify the the way the the randomness works or the way the Markov chain runs to try to escape from a local mode. So interesting there's probably a lot more we could say about that but i'll leave it there for now all right thank you thank you uh, my question is uh, uh, when you mentioned the computational complexity and also the efficiency of the algorithm do you mean the same thing okay right i think you were asking before right so yeah so computation we wrote a separate paper about that let me just try to find the uh the um link uh here maybe right so yeah, so the basic idea of this, uh, so I mean, first of all, computational complexity in general, as you may or may not know, is uh, to do with how long you have to run an algorithm in order for it to converge, or in this case, get within some small epsilon of, of the true target distribution. And uh, so with MCMC, you might have to run it for a long time for it to converge, but computational complexity usually looks at how long you have to run it as a function of, in this case, the dimension of the state space. And uh, if it's a higher dimensional state space, First of all, each move might take longer. That's a separate issue. But even beyond that, uh, the number of steps that you need to run um, will get bigger too. But what this kind of algorithm shows, what this kind of argument shows, because it says if you speed it up by a factor of D, so remember um, we said, I guess it's back here, we said if you speed up by a factor of D, and that that's when you can converge to a limiting diffusion, which is sort of an order one diffusion. So by speeding up by a factor of D, we converge to something which converges in order one steps. And that means that the original algorithm converges in order D steps. And this isn't too bad. It means that in higher dimensions, you know, if the dimension gets twice as big, you're gonna have to run it for twice as many iterations, but that's not too bad. It's not exponential or anything. So hope that provides- uh, Actually, my exact question is, if uh, when you done this time rescue with this D and uh, it made it converge to the infinite dimensional diffusion, this convergence, I understand it mathematically, but why 
why it related to how many steps it required for the algorithm to convert? Yeah, What's so the lead? So what I'm trying to say is that um, what we're saying is that in the limit you get an order one diffusion. So once you've done that, where to have it? Once you've done this speed up, then the speeded up version is going to be an order one thing. It no longer has any dimension in it, so it converges in an amount of time which doesn't depend on dimension. But we got that after speeding it up by a dimension. So I'll leave it at that for now. We could talk uh, later, but let's see if there's any other questions now. Any other questions for now? Uh, yeah, I'm a student from bioinformatics, and uh, I have a question about that last example where the algorithm gets trapped. Sure. This one, um, right. So could you take the idea from some sort of genetic algorithms and just say um, sort of like exploration versus exploitation? Um, so if you're stuck at somewhere for too long a time, you can just randomly jump to another point. Like right. A sample from there. Yeah, so that that's a good question. It's actually, it's related to to a bigger issue, which is that um, often when running these MCMC things, we we'd like to do things kind of like you're implying, like, well, we're getting stuck, so you know what, just change something and do it again, and so um, you know maybe just start from a random point and start again and that kind of thing. Now, if you're just doing an optimization, that is, you're trying to find the maximum value or something, which I've also worked on some. In some sense, your life is easier because you can do stuff like that. You can have you know random restarts here and change this and so on. But in our case, we're trying to actually get a sample, right? We're trying to estimate probabilities and expected values. And then in some sense, you have to be a lot more careful. I mean, for example, just this adapting, right? I mean, if you were just trying to find a maximum, well, you could adapt any way you want and there's no real rules as long as you're trying to find the biggest value that you can. But in this case, we're trying to get the, um, the actual uh, sample. So anything you do, whether it's this adapting, which depends on the whole history, or the kind of thing you're proposing, you say, well, if you get stuck for a while, just do a, a random restart and start again. You can do them, but you have to be careful because then you're no longer having the, the basic markup chain design, which is going to actually converge to the right sample. So you might be able to do it, but you have to be careful because like, for example, suppose you said, yeah, I'm going to just run MCMC, but I'll make a rule. If I ever get stuck for too many iterations, I'll just do a random restart and start again. Well, sounds reasonable, but what it means in practice is that your resulting samples will undersample from the places where you tend to get stuck more, right? Like the original Metropolis algorithm was set up just right. So those accept reject steps give you the right limiting probabilities. But then if you say, well, if I get stuck for a while, you know, forget it, I'll just start fresh. It sounds reasonable, but it means you'll get actually a smaller number of samples from the stickier parts of the state space, which you might feel that you want, but it does mean that your limiting sample won't be the correct one. So, I mean, you know, depending on your application that that might be okay, and may, or maybe you can find a way to correct for it, or you can bound. You know, maybe it won't make too much difference, and you can bound that. But but you do have to be careful because the the basic principle that says you're going to converge to the right distribution that's actually something which requires just running the markup chain, not doing any of these little interferences. So it's a good question. So the answer is you can kind of sort of do that, but you have to be careful because it messes up the basic properties. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, any further questions? I know it's five minutes after I hear you just finished your semester teaching. Probably all just want to go home. Well, maybe you're already home. I don't even know. But uh, anyway. Uh, can, you, can you comment on the state space? So your technique is required to have a real state space, right? For the, def for the SDE to hold. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, so actually the um, it's true. Well, I guess the original theorems about the uh, limiting diffusion were on a uh, continuous state space. but but since we're actually shrinking space by a factor of square root of d, even discrete spaces would shrink down to being continuous. But but let me just see if there's any other questions before we wrap up. Are there any other uh, questions from anybody else? Um, when you're talking about hi, Kevin Gettner here with Kennesaw sure. State. Uh, when you're hi. talking about the the adaptive process and how you're determining when to turn it to adaptive, are you are you taking into any consideration with the the burn in? Uh, at, at where you're burning in and defining that adaption point of, of kind of when you're going to implement the adaptive process? Right. Yeah. So it's a good question. Um, in a way, let me just maybe go to the graph. Where's that uh, graph that looks like a tornado? So um, uh, yeah, this one here. So, so yeah. So in this case, we're pretty much starting the adaption right from the beginning. Um, now, that's not quite true because if you have a very small number of samples, you can't even estimate the empirical covariance because you don't have enough samples. But once you have enough samples to estimate the empirical covariance, which is just you know, essentially having D or like a small multiple of D uh, uh, samples, 
then you can start doing the empirical. So we kind of start doing it here. And the logic is, well, we better start because if we don't start, we're just going to keep getting bad samples and we're actually never going to improve. Um, but on the other hand, um, you're right to ask about burn-in because in some sense, it's already bad enough with MCMC burn-in because you say, well, I don't really know how long do I have to run it before it's going to converge. Here we have sort of a double burn-in problem because we say, well, if we run it for a while, maybe it hasn't converged so we're not getting good samples. And even if we were, we have to run the adaption long enough to have a good adaption. So there's kind of a double burn-in problem here. And that's why we typically have to run these for quite a while, even, even for, for relatively simple examples to say, you know, the adaption that starts with bad samples gradually gets to work better. And then we gradually get some decent samples. And then if we run it long enough, hopefully we've adapted to be a good markup chain and our samples are pretty good. So now if we start fresh, we'll do it. So, so it is a problem. And in fact, the, I think I mentioned briefly the, um, the uh, practical alternative of running for a while and then ceasing to adapt. So we call this sort of an adaptive convergence diagnostic. And our logic was kind of, you know, get the computer just by using some, you know, a heuristic rule of thumb, but to say, how long do we run it till the adaption isn't really changing things that much anymore? And then we stop, which is roughly saying, how do we figure out where this orange bar is, right? How do we figure out once we've done enough adapting and enough markup chain running that we've got pretty good markup chain and pretty good samples, and now we can run it. But it's a good question. So we think not so much when do you start the adapting, because we started pretty much right away, but when do you say you're satisfied with it? So. I don't know if that helps, but but it's oh, a good question. I appreciate that. Yeah, because again, can I ask a quick question? <laughs> yeah, please. Hi, Jeff. It's Jana. Oh, hey, Jana. Um, hi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, you're sort of the adaptive process. You're sort of learning a good Markov kernel in some sense, sort of uh, trying to understand. Have you thought about doing a weighted version of that? So. Um, if, if you think about the weighting as, say, doubling some of the edges, then you still satisfy detailed balance and you'll still, you'll, you'll just understand that certain edges should be heavier and you could do, you could learn that process as you're going along, just as you're learning how to walk on these weighted edges. So ha have you done something along these lines? Because it actually seems like it might be doable. Yeah, well, what, what if I understand you correctly, um... You're right that if you change, as you call it, the edges, you know, if you're doing that, or even, I mean, even going back to this example, um, you know, we're changing our radius, right? This issue, so let me just get to the right yeah. point, this issue of how much we propose by, but, but you could still say for this one too, you say, look, for any particular step on any particular choice, we're still running a metropolis algorithm with success project, so we satisfy detailed balance, and that's true, but on the other hand, it still doesn't converge to the right thing, right? And the issue is, because we're changing, even though at each step we're running a valid markup chain, which is reversible, satisfies detail balance, but because we're changing which one we run as we go based on the history, we're actually no longer guaranteed to converge the right thing. So if I understood your proposal correctly, it's actually gonna have the same, the same issue. That is to say, adjusting the, the weighting of the, the edges is more or less another version of adjusting the choice of the Metropolis proposal or whatever, but still satisfying detail balance. But because so, you're guessing as you go, you won't, if I understood you correctly, but the, but the difference is that for any fixed edge weights, the Markov chain will eventually converge to the right distribution, right? right so right. so if, if you know that the um, distribution on edge weights is improving and getting closer, then you're only going to have better convergence. So that's what I was trying to work out while you were doing this, whether I, I understand your point, but I think it, it might not have the same issue because you're not getting better and worse. You're, you're just going to be learning what good weights are. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, it, it may you know, work well in, in practice, let's say, but it won't have the guarantee of convergence, as I say, because um, you're right that, you know, for any fixed choice of weights, it will eventually converge yeah. just like here for any fixed proposal, it will eventually converge, but you're still changing as you go. Now it may be true that if you've got a good way of updating the weights, it will tend to improve it and it will tend to yeah. convert better. I mean, obviously this was a pretty artificial example to show how it can mess sure. things up. And uh, you know, if I go to a more typical one like this, let's say, in principle, this has the same theoretical problem and yet in practice it converts as well. So, so I agree with that too, but I do think there's still a, a theoretical issue because you're changing your markup chain transitions as you go, even though each particular choice works. But anyway, it, but we can it, talk about it more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, also just in terms of if it does converge to the right distribution, whether this improves the optimality that you're finding. 
through this adaptive process. It might give you better options. So anyway, uh, we could talk about it offline. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Let's talk about it more. Sure, sounds good. Thanks, thanks, Dana. Thanks for uh, coming. I should admit, I, I only told her I was originally going to visit Georgia and then I was going to visit her in Atlanta. And then uh, one hour ago, <laughs> one hour before we talked, it occurred to me, you know, I should probably tell her I'm doing the Zoom talks. I really appreciate your uh, coming on such short notice. Um, anyway, okay. So it's about 12 after, maybe a good point to wrap things up, do you think? Um, of course, I can stick around if people want to talk more, but probably it's a good time to end the formalities and let people go home after the end of your semesters. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk and uh, it was a great honor to have you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.